So on behalf of uh, the Brahmakumaris family here in Leicester, everyone here at Harmony House, a very warm welcome to today's International Women's Day program. Uh, we call it a family here because, well, that's what it is. And I hope that for the duration of this afternoon, you feel part of the family here and, and feel that heart connection uh, with everything that is happening here. Very warm welcome indeed. I really like this um, message that is on the screen behind me, press for progress. The secret of change is to focus our energy not on fighting, but on building newness. It's a lovely word, newness. And I hope that during the course of the afternoon we'll be exploring what newness means in the context of International Women's Day. It's worth just pausing for a moment before we go any further to just reflect on all the women right around the world on this day who are being honoured, who are being celebrated. There are events happening at grassroots level, at government level, um, in countries right around the world. Uh, it, it's, quite a, it's quite a thought that we're all connected on this day. We're all particularly thinking about the role of women, about the role of the feminine in today's society. And it feels as if there is actually a bit of a shift going on at the moment. In fact, over the last couple of years, if you reflect on the fact that we had the women's marches, I don't know if you remember those about 18 months ago, pretty much every major city around the world had a quite sizable number of women marching, uh, marching to draw attention to the need for women's voices to be heard more in society. It had quite an impact at the time. Uh, last year as well, we've had this wave of Me Too conversations that have been going on uh, in workplaces and different industries, women calling out for the need uh, for more respect in the workplace, uh, for women to be treated with dignity. It's been quite a, a high-profile discussion that has been going on globally. And here in the UK as well, we've had quite a public debate around the inequalities of women's pay at the BBC, at Tesco's, at other organisations. So it really feels that on this centenary year of the suffragettes, it's 100 years this year since women had the right to vote in this country, that there seems to be another wave coming through of, of calling not just for gender equality, but for the, the qualities of the feminine to be truly honoured and acknowledged and put in a place of importance at the heart of society. And if we look at the way the world is around us, I think you'd all agree that, that the feminine has a particular contribution to make, which the world can no longer afford to ignore. And that's what we're going to be looking at and exploring uh, this afternoon with our panel guests who will be joining us shortly. Before we hear from them, though, um, we have a video for you to watch, um, which has been put together by Brother Manis, who is one of the brothers here at Harmony House. And it's a video really looking at inspirational leadership and the qualities of the feminine, the role that women are playing in society, and the role that women possibly can play more of in the future. So after all your exertion, I think you deserve five, ten minutes of just sitting quietly and reflecting. So enjoy this video that Brother Manis has put together for us. Thank you.
honored that I am being chosen as a Nobel laureate and I have been honored with this, this precious award to the Nobel Peace Prize. Growing up in Mississippi, my prayer was, for as long as I can remember, God use me. Use me, use this life. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I know that there is a vision for my life that is greater than my imagination can hold. Use me, use me, what would you have me to do? And that dream, that desire, that prayer brought me somehow to television. I understand that you work as hard as you can, you do as much as you can do, but you are in partnership with that which is your creator. And that when you can align with that, which is the creator's vision for your life, because your being here is a part of a force of creation that's greater than you can ever know. And when you can align with that, not just your vision, but what is that vision for you, which I believe every human being has, you are your most powerful. Those women who have taken on the heavy burden of attending to others need also to be attended, not just for their own sake, but for the good of us all. Health and happiness taken at the cost of others' pain and suffering cannot be acceptable. Women have a right to their own peace of mind. Each person is born with individual qualities and potential. We as a society owe it to women to create a truly supportive environment into which they too can grow and move forward. We call upon our sisters around the world to be brave, to embrace the strength within themselves and realize their full potential. Dear brothers and sisters, we want schools and education for every child's bright future. We will continue our journey to our destination of peace and education. No one can stop us. Our words can change the whole world because we are all together, united for the cause of education. And if we want to achieve our goal, then let us empower ourselves with the weapon of knowledge. And let us shield ourselves with unity and togetherness. Because today, I know from experience that if I truly want to leave a better world for my daughters and, and for all of our sons and daughters, if, if we want to give all of our children a foundation for their dreams and opportunities worthy of their promise, if, if we want to give them that sense of limitless possibility, that belief that here in America, there is always something better out there if you're willing to work for it, then we must work like never before. And we must once again come together and stand together. Each of us must truly be a woman in the world. We need to be as fearless as the women whose stories you have applauded, as committed as the dissidents and activists you have heard from, as audacious as those who start movements for peace when all seems lost. Together, I do believe it is part of the American mission to ensure that people everywhere, women and men alike, finally have the opportunity to live up to their own God-given potential. May it remind me and every little child that no matter where you're from, your dreams are valid. Thank you. If we stop defining each other by what we are not and start defining ourselves by who we are, we can all be freer.
human rights is must come about in the hearts of people we must want our fellow human beings to have rights and freedoms which give them dignity and which will give them a sense that they are human beings that can walk the earth with their heads high and look all men in the face if we observe these rights for ourselves and for others, I think we will find that it is easier in the world to build peace because war destroys all human rights and freedoms. So in fighting for those, we fight for peace. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Where does this love begin? In our own family, in our own home. How does it begin? By praying together. Family that prays together stays together. And if you stay together, you will love one another as God loves each one of you. Today, the world, in the world, is so much suffering because of that one of prayer, of unity in the family. So today, when we are together, let us make one strong resolution that we will bring prayer in our family, that we will teach our children to pray and pray with them. And you will see the joy and the love and the peace that will come into your hearts. Because the fruit of prayer is the deepening of faith. And the fruit of faith is love. And the fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. Works of love are works of peace. That is why let us bring the tender love of God in our family. Shanti. For me, success would be when my mind words and actions are in harmony, when every thought and feeling I create is pure and elevated, when every energy that I create and radiate out to everyone around me is for their empowerment and empowerment for myself, that's true success.
interviewed and portrayed people who've withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you, but the one quality all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Women need a seat at the table. They need an invitation to be seated there. And in some cases, where this isn't available, well then you know what? Then they need to create their own table. We need, we need a global understanding that we cannot implement change effectively without women's political participation. It is said that girls with dreams become women with vision. May we empower each other to carry out such vision because it isn't enough to simply talk about equality. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to simply believe in it. One must work at it. Let us work at it together, starting now. Thank you so much. We may have come from many different countries and cultures within our hearts. I think we hold the same vision of a better world, of greater security, peace, justice, understanding and respect for all people. Once we have seen in the eye of our mind that such a world can and should exist, it is a responsibility to help make it happen. And the world will only be a better place when its inhabitants are better people. The past 60 years of my life have been dedicated is this to realizing a vision of a better self and better world. Houses can be built with the bricks, but it is what is in our hearts that builds a lovely home. Om Shanti, a greeting of peace to my sisters and my brothers. We are here together today to honor International Women's Day, honored by the United Nations. And maybe people think that, well, in today's world, everything is fine. Everyone does have equal rights. Well, it's interesting that even in the developed world, there are still discrepancies in terms of rights. For example, domestic violence, that comes to mind instantly. Another factor may be equal pay for equal work. That still isn't something that actually happens. And also, I think maybe um, housework. I wonder how many men and women share the housework equally. Or is it that even though a woman is having a full day's job outside somewhere, yet she's expected to come home and do everything at home also? I know that things are shifting, but maybe the speed with which we can press to change can happen all the faster. This is the theme that the United Nations has taken up this year, press for change. And I think that it's very important because men and women together need to make this shift to bring about a better world. If I look around the state of the world today, I don't see many men being very happy. And so to me, it's an indication that we need to do something to make the world a happier place for men and women. And I think equality um, between the genders will make a big, big difference in making that happen. I would also like to suggest that it's very important for a woman to recognize her own spiritual identity and through that come back to the inner state of values that the soul holds. And this is also something for men, of course, brothers and sisters, men and women, we all need to go on that inner journey and discover our own being within so that we're able to hold our head up high with dignity. We're able to have value for the self and respect for each other equally. 
And so yeah. the message now is really to come together, press for change so that together we create a better world. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to now invite our panellists to come and join me up on the stage. Um, you know who you are. I shall introduce you in just a moment. If you could make your way up. Uh, we have Sister Indu. We have Jan. Uh, Shoba, everybody, you'd like to come and join us. Um, whilst they're coming up onto the stage, um, I'll just share uh, something with you that I came across during this last week. Um, it was actually last weekend when I was in York. Um, my niece is at university there, and it was her 21st birthday. We're going to be doing meditation. You're lovely there. That's perfect. Um, yes, I was in York for my niece's 21st birthday, and as part of her celebrations, we went to the Jorvik Museum, which is the, the Museum of, of the Vikings. Uh, and of course, um, York was very important in, in years gone by. And in fact, the whole country was governed from York. Um, and it was a fascinating um, tour, actually on the site of where they had done this excavation of a, of a Viking city in, in the heart of York itself. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I, I learned about one thing during, during that tour. And that is that in, in Viking society, Girls at the age of 13 were given the keys to their own house. They became homeowners at the age of 13. And when and if they had a husband, all their husband's belongings were their possession. So in law, they owned everything that their husband owned as well. It belonged to them as the woman. And also they had an automatic right to divorce, should they want to get divorced. And this was in 900 and something. And I thought that was fascinating, that all those years ago, women had, had a status and a role in society that you could argue was more in advance of, of what we have today. And it sort of challenged this idea that we're sort of moving forwards towards equality, when perhaps there was equality that existed in the past. And I know here at the Brahma Kumaris there is a sense that there was a time in our history when the male and female were almost perfectly balanced, were in harmony. And so I just throw that out as a challenge to our assumption that we're, we're moving towards something that hasn't existed before, when perhaps it is naturally there in our story as uh, humanity, in our past, and that maybe what we're doing at this point in time is, is returning once again to a time when these two polarities, the opposites of male and female, come into harmony, work together in unity, and, and that that is what we're experiencing in the world at this time. I share that with you because I just found that so interesting. <clears throat> So our panel today are going to be taking up some of these issues that have been touched upon in the video that we were just watching, uh, looking at how change is happening in society. And it really feels as if we're standing on the shoulders of some of these great women that have gone before. They all spoke so beautifully about the work that they are doing. And today we have four examples of women who are out there in the world also challenging some of our assumptions around gender and, and making a difference and making change. If I start on our far left, we have Shoba Earl, uh, who works for the RAF, as you can probably tell from her very beautiful uniform. In fact, she worked 25 years as a regular and 15 years as a reserve, which, if you add that together, is quite a long time. Uh, she, during that time, was the chief clerk at... HR, Human Resources, um, and she was also the first Asian female to reach warrant officer rank within the RAF, and then most recently she had a role as command warrant officer for the reserves, and that was the first time again that an Asian female had held that role, and it was actually that role which gave her a recognition in this year's New Year's Honours list in which she was honoured with a Queen's Volunteer Reserves Medal 
in recognition of that. So, Shoba, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, so let's carry on down the line now, and um, we move to a woman who uh, is herself no stranger to shaking and moving, um, Mimadar Duke, who uh, most recently has been uh, voted as the Leicester Mercury Businesswoman of the Year, which I think in itself is, is quite a, a wonderful achievement. But Mahmouda is with us on the stage today in her capacity as Deputy Lieutenant for Leicestershire and Rutland. And we really are delighted that you're here uh, representing that very important role. Uh, so by training, she was a lawyer. Um, and uh, she has been, since 2015, the president of Leicestershire's Law Society. And another first here for an Asian woman. It's the first time in its 155-year history that a woman, an Asian woman, has held this role. Uh, she also does another couple of quite interesting things. She's on the governing council for the University of Leicester. And uh, one for the boys here. She's the first female of the board of Leicestershire County Cricket, which um, sounds to me as if it's a, a very important job. And if Leicester takes its cricket even half as seriously, seriously as it takes its football, uh, I can only imagine um, the importance of, of the role there that's being done. So a round of applause, please, because I think that's <laughs> wonderful achievement. Uh, so then we come to Sister Indu, uh, who has been here at Harmony House since it opened three years ago, working as the coordinator. And I'm sure all of you, since you've been here, have been struck by the harmony that is in this house. It, is, it really is quite a special energy and experience being here, seeing so many people working together so harmoniously. It's not something you see everywhere, and I have a sense that some of that is attributed to Sister Indu and her way in which she... she it, we're talking about leadership here. It's the way in which she does lead this group um, mm. with such harmony and, and such skill and beauty. In fact, I experienced it myself uh, on the phone to Sister Indu just as late as last night, um, like many of you here, where I live has been uh, besieged with all the snowstorms that we've had. And I was saying to Sister Indu, look, I'm, you know, I'm really not sure I'm going to be able to get out of my drive, never mind, never mind down my lane, because the only vehicles that have been moving around have been tractors. And I said, still, I'm, I'm, holding, I'm holding out for a thaw, uh, and, and that might make all the difference. And she said, well, you're holding out for a thaw. I'm holding out for a thought and for a determined thought that it will be possible and you will be there tomorrow. So I have Sister Indy to thank for the fact that it thawed and here I am. So she's a powerful being. And last but by no means least, we have Deacon Jan Sutton, who is a minister in the Methodist Church. She's also coordinating a group of chaplains at Loughborough University. And she's the founder and coordinator um, of a project called the Loughborough Street Pastors. And they have a very beautiful contribution to make in that they go out after dark and they minister to people sleeping rough on the streets. Um, it's something that's been happening for the past 10 years. And Jan has been spearheading that and coordinating that. Um, she's also one of the 100 Women of Spirit, a group of 100 women that were brought together to honour Daddy Janky, who we heard from in our inspirational video just a few moments ago, uh, women who are using spirituality in the work that they do, and Jan very clearly is doing exactly that. So please, a round of applause for Jan. Uh, you saw in that video, though, a little clip from Daddy Janki, um, and she is the head of the Brahma Kumaris, uh, who are the people at this organization that we're at today. And one of the things that first attracted me to the Brahma Kumaris many years ago now um, was the fact that it was a women-led organization. And there was something around uh, the role of women in society at this time that the founder of the organization, um, Prajapita Brahma, Brahma Baba, felt was really important. And this principle of women being put to the fore is something that was there back in 1936, 1937, when the organization was first established. 
at that time, women did not have a tremendously high-profile role in society by any means. Uh, they were seen as being the possession of their, their husband or, or their father-in-law or whoever it was. They certainly didn't have any voice within uh, the spiritual circles of the time. So this organization that came along was really quite groundbreaking in that respect. And now in our 80th year, I think the Brahma Kumaris are time and time again demonstrating the contribution that women connected to their spiritual uh, source, their spiritual sustenance, can and are achieving great things in the world. Uh, so let's just begin um, with a question for our panelists. And this is, this is to be a, you know, a, a relaxed conversation. It's not question time, by the way. Uh, I'm not going to be um, you know, interrogating you like um, Jeremy Paxman or anything. It's, it's a conversation which I think, you know, let's face it, as women, we're very good at talking. Um, so you know, don't feel shy to, to sort of chip in. But I'd like to just ask you, each of you, in the work that you're doing, the extent to which you feel women doing your job are making a contribution and making a difference on account of the fact that they are women. Shall we begin with you, Shoba? Because in the armed forces, it's not an area that has traditionally uh, been that easy for women to break into and to succeed in. What has your experience been? Um, certainly, when, when I first joined the Air Force, there weren't that many women. Um, and we've made a lot of progress to actually get to where we are today so that the Air Force reflects the society that we, will, we live in. So currently we, we have 14% females in the Royal Air Force and by 2020 we're aiming to have 20%. So compared with what's going on in, in civilian roles, that, that's very good progress that we're making. Um, and the women that I meet all the time, we're all making a huge difference because we bring our own uniqueness to the game and uh, what we offer is often a different way of thinking and a different way of act your actions, which uh, You've worked has a good in result. the HR department, so you, you've clearly been sort of there seeing at, at the actual, you know, nose of the grindstone of what is happening. Do, do women manage to contribute as women or do you find that they sort of become honorary men in the role that they're doing? Um, it does vary depending on the individual. The HR role is, we do actually have quite a lot of females within that role. Uh, however, I've worked in sections where I have often only been the one female, the token female that works in that area. So I think what you have to do is be true to yourself mm -hmm. and your qualities will shine through. Lead by example. You, you do what you think is right and correct and don't be swayed by what you think is the right thing to do. To be true to yourself. Uh, and I know that there is actual complete equality of pay within the RAF for men and women doing the same job. Uh, that is something that, that is absolutely achieved. Yes, again, this is, this is one of the things that has been addressed over the years. So gradually, um, certainly when I first joined, there was lots of things that were different. I couldn't have uh, my son at that time because if I had a child, I would have had to leave the Air Force. So I actually waited a long time before I started my family because if I had done that sooner, my career would have ended. So things like that have been changed now, and we've made a, a lot of headway, and I, I think we are definitely going in the right direction. And I know this year as well, women have been accepted on the kind of the front line of, of, of combat, and that was the last barrier, if you like, to women within the RAF. Absolutely, that's the station I'm currently serving at at the moment, at RF Honington, and the trade is called RF Regiment. It's the Air Force's version of the Army, if you like. They do our security and protection side of uh, the RF role. And uh, we just currently have females going through the training now alongside the men. And hopefully, you know, they, they will come through at the end of that and just prove that anything is possible. Absolutely. Jan, let's move to you now, because you're, in a way, representing the Christian church, although you yourself are a, a Methodist. And let's face it, it's been quite a long struggle, hasn't it, for women to really uh, make an inroad, either to be ordained or, or now to be ordained as bishops within the Church of England. That does now happen. Uh, for you within the Methodist church, has it been an equally long and hard struggle? As a, a deacon in the Methodist church, I belong to a religious order, and the religious order began where it was a religious order just for women. 
So at that time when there was no other um, leadership offered to women in the Methodist Church, they became deacons and they had to sacrifice a lot more than I've got to sacrifice today. They weren't allowed to get married. So now our um, elderly sisters who were in their 80s and their 90s, the order is their only family because they, they weren't allowed a family. They weren't allowed to get married. They would have been looked upon as falling from grace and asked to leave the order. Women in the Methodist Church have been able to be ordained for quite a, a number of years longer than, um, than in, in the Anglican Church. And have we seen a difference in the way they do their ministry, would you say? Has it, has it had an impact on the church as a whole? It has had an impact on the church as a whole. And, and as, uh, particularly when I, I look at the diaconal order, which I'm part of, the deacons were the members of the church who were sent out onto the mission field. They were sent abroad to work. And they were looked upon as doing, if you like, getting down on their hands and knees and doing the dirty work, doing the practical work of the church. Uh, if I could compare it, a very similar ministry to what like Mother Teresa um, and perhaps Daddy Janke would have also um, experienced. So taking the church out into the community very much. Yeah. 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 Lovely. We'll hear some more about that in a moment. I'd like to just bring in Mahmouda at this point. Uh, in your introductions, Mahmoud, it, it kind of seems a little bit like you've been on a one-woman mission to just break glass ceilings wherever <laughs> you saw them. Um, if we look at what you've achieved in the world of law, um, in academia, um, and also in your work um, as a lawyer, specialising in, in clinical negligence and becoming the president, is this something that you, you, you kind of did consciously set out to kind of make a point almost? I didn't set out to do any of that, actually. Um, I set out really just to do a good job, um, and, I, and if I take it a step, further, a step further back, I started life as a teacher. Um, I trained as a teacher and I taught for a year and then decided that I was going to convert to law. So no, um, I, I didn't set out to do all of those things and I didn't set out to break any glass ceilings either. But um, I became a lawyer, I went to London, I did my training contract in London. Um, and. Once I'd got my training contract, I then qualified and, and, and became a clinical negligence specialist. Um, in terms of breaking glass ceilings, I think had I become a partner in a, in a, in a national law firm, I probably would have, that, that is where I was heading, or that is what I wanted to do. That was my mission. Um, I didn't quite do that, and I, 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 came, I did have some hurdles along the way um, in getting there. So at that point, what I did was I set up my own law firm. I thought, if I'm not going to be a partner in a law firm, I'll, as, as you heard Meghan Markle say, if you don't get a seat at the table, set up your own table. Yeah. And that's what I did. So I set up my own table. I set up my own law firm. And I basically decided, if I go back, I did dream that one day I'd be the head of it. I would be the senior partner of a law firm. When I knew that wasn't going to happen at somebody else's law firm, I decided that the only way I was going to do it was if I did it myself, and so that's what, that's what I did. So there were some visions that I had, there were some dreams that I had, and, in, and I had to create some of those dreams, but in terms of breaking the ceilings, that isn't what I set out to do. That, that kind of happened organically. So you were definitely one of these girls with a, a dream that turned into yes. a woman with a vision. Yes. And, and would you say that your practice has got an ethos about it that is imbued with qualities of the feminine? Is yes. that something that you have, have tried to instill? Yes, I, I think so. I mean, for, for many years, um, I, I have to say this very quietly, I wasn't very good at equality and diversity in the sense that we were mostly women. Uh, we do now have a much greater balance um, uh, uh, of, of men and women. However, the work that I do is, is medical negligence is what I do, and that to do that requires a lot of empathy. I, I see patients, I, I, I see cl their clients who were once patients who have had things happen to them. They've been victims um, of the NHS or of, of, of things that have happened. And for us, it's all about empathy. It's all about the, the, the feminine side, I think, plays a really, really important role in the work that I do. And when you have achieved each of the different successes that you have, 
was your response to, to kind of punch the air and, and sort of celebrate that at last a woman was now doing this? And is, is that a role that you relished, being in that limelight? No. Every time I was asked to do something, my initial reaction was to say, I can't do this. No, I'm not going to do it. And I had a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Because for me, I was terrified. I was terrified of the responsibility. I was terrified of failure. All of the things, that, that was repeated so many times um, on, on some of the slides that, or, or on the, the films, that, the clips that you saw. But I had to overcome that. The fear was something that I had to deal with. It was something that I had to talk myself out of because much as I was afraid of the responsibility, I felt I needed to embrace the responsibility and work my way through it. Because for me, it was about being a role model. It was an opportunity and it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. So I had to work on the fear. I had to, to, to overcome that and believe that I could do it. So as um, sister here said, you had, to, you, had to create your, you had to create your world and I had to believe that I could do it and that failure wasn't an option. And so I worked hard. And again, you heard that. It was a repeated message. We, I had to work really, really hard to do what I did and to do it well and to be that role model so that I encouraged other people who saw me do what I did to also want to do what I had done that you were there in a world tra tra trailblazing yes. on behalf of others yes. coming behind you. Yes. It's important to sort of hear someone like you speak like that because we sometimes, I think, feel that people who achieve greatness are somehow different from us mere mortals, that they have qualities that we don't have. But, you know, I, I wonder if any, anyone achieving in any of these platforms that we saw has gone through a similar journey of, of really struggling with that sense of not being worthy or not being able to do what they're doing. So thank you for sharing that. That was you know, lovely to hear. Um, Sister Indu, uh, you've been with the Brahma Kumaris for 30 years, this organization that is now uh, in over 140 countries throughout the world, has been led by women uh, for 80 years now. What have you seen that you would describe as being uniquely feminine in the way that the organization has been led. What is the role of, of the feminine principle within that? Um, what I see is that females play many roles. Is the Om Shanti. Om Shanti. We all know that women play many different roles. And when I was doing my teacher's training, teacher's training means to teach meditation. Then one hint that I got from our uh, Dari Janki, she's the one who heads the organization, and I don't even think she realized what she was saying. She just said it, just like, you know, in passing. And she said that when you have students in front of you, then you're a teacher. So like when you're on the stage and you're teaching, at that time you're a teacher. But the minute you get off that stage, then you're a mother, you're a friend, you're a sister, you're a helper, you're everything but a teacher. And I like that a lot, that you're not a teacher 24 hours. And I want to also refer to what you were speaking about law. I actually started studying law because that was my ambition when I was at school, that I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, in England, there's no such thing as a lawyer. It's solicitor or barrister. And so I started studying that, but I saw that it was very, very tough. You had to be tough because of the kind of, it didn't matter whether the person was right or wrong. What mattered was the precedent, what decision had already been made in the past. So it was like to make a decision, you had to look at a textbook. And then I found that very strange that you weren't looking at the person, you weren't looking at the circumstances, you were looking at what was the previous decision made by other judges in the past. And then I realized some point early on, and I'm thankful I didn't go too deep into it, is that I don't have the toughness that it requires to be a solicitor lawyer, because I'd seen the kind of work that was involved, and you have to be very, very tough, and I say hats off to you for carrying on with that work. 
And so the, what I've always felt is that you have to play many, many different roles as a woman. You know, that it's not just one role that we're playing. Within seconds, within minutes, you're changing roles all the time. But if we look at the example of Daddy Janki, mm. uh, as a for instance, there is that toughness there. You wouldn't describe her as being a pushover by any means. No. And yet there is also this softness. Yes. And that's quite hard to find the two in one person. <laughs> I think she's tough on herself. Means she's tough that she makes sure she walks her talk. If she can't walk her talk, then she's not going to talk. So she walks her talk. <coughs> she practices what she preaches. So the toughness in a, is towards herself and the softness is towards others. That's how I would best describe it. She's not tough on others because I've seen her being very loving with others but very disciplined with the self. I wouldn't call it toughness, I'd say disciplined. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, in terms of, of leadership style, do you think that, that the women leaders in the Brahma Kumaris have, have in a way pioneered what is possible for women to, to bring those feminine qualities at the same time as including that masculine drive? Yes, I remember once um, somebody had come, a consultant had come, and he'd come to teach us about leadership. So we were a group of about 50 of us, and all of us following the path of spirituality. And he'd come specially to teach us about leadership. It was called self-managing leadership. And so it was everything opposite of what we'd learned in spirituality. So in this, it was, you know, you should know your weaknesses, what are your strengths, well, you know, all these kind of things, what we hear when we're doing leadership training. And what we learned in spirituality was very different. So I was like, I was questioning that now what, which, which path do we follow? Do we go what we've learned already, the meditation, seeing others as souls, all of these things? Or do we work with this self-managing -manage, leadership? So I asked Daddy Janki, would you say there's a right or a wrong? And she goes, it's not a question of right or wrong. Because then you say, okay, this person's wrong and this person's right. That judgment is already, you've alien, alienated yourself from people. But she said that leadership is, um, leadership is being an example. That's what leadership is about. It's not that this way is right and that way is ro wrong, but being the example of what it is that you want to put across. I, I guess at the end of the day, if you want to bring about change, one of the simplest ways of doing that is to just be the change that you want to see become yes. an example of that. Yeah. Um, and I know, Shoba, that you know, in the work that you've done, you found that that was actually the most effective thing, is just to be what you would like to see. Oh, absolutely, because um, you know, different people have different ideas of what is right and wrong. Mm. Um, and certainly as a female in a mainly male environment, you have to be seen to be different. And I think the only way you do that is by being true and, and, and leading by example of what you think is the right thing. And I know we were sharing earlier a lovely phrase from your mother, Mamuda, who, who said that your word is your world, that in a way, as you think, so you will become, as is your vision, so is your world. And that's something that you very much worked with in your career. Absolutely. I'm wondering if Indu's um, little microphone here is picking up some of the sound. Is that, is that still switched on? I'm switched on. Yeah. Yes, sorry. So for me, my mother always said, your word creates your world. So for me, I'd always dreamt that I would be senior partner of a law firm. And I created that vision for myself at a very, very young age. Um, I created the vision of being a leader of a law firm or a leader, whichever I did, I, that, that was something that I created at a very young age. Um, so <coughs> being head girl, doing this, always wanting to do the best that I could do. So my word was, that's what, how I created my word. In essence. But I think one thing I'd like to share is um, that 
I also, for, for women, women in the Asian community um, to be a businesswoman, to do well, um, was also something that I was very keen to do. And I, and I business was a, that was always in the back of my mind. I come from a family of business people. Um, and then people often said, you know, it's difficult in a man's world. But I was, I was inspired by, I take it a bit further back, you talked about the Vikings. Mm. If we take it back to the sixth century, and we take it back to the Prophet Muhammad's wife, she was, she was my biggest inspiration. She was a woman in a man's world in Saudi Arabia, and she was enormously successful, enormously well-respected. And she, at the age of 40, married the Prophet Muhammad, at the age of who was 25. So she made it. She was a well-respected businesswoman in a man's world. And for me, that vision was, that was my world. And that's what I wanted to create for myself. Did you, Jan, have any role models who particularly inspired you? My grandma. Um, my grandma was a tiny lady in stature, but she's the biggest person I've ever, ever met. And when I look back, she showed me how to love by the way she lived her life. And, um, and she said uh, similar things in that. She would say, if you haven't got anything good and positive to add to a conversation, don't say anything. Just stay silent but speak when, when your voice will make a difference. And, and she was just a remarkable lady in my life. Mm -hmm. We're talking here about the, the role of, of women, but in a way it's as much about the qualities of, of the feminine. Uh, and I'd like to include all the men that are here this afternoon in that, because of course in the Brahma Kumaras there's this understanding of, of being a soul, not the body and that the soul is neither male nor female, that where each of us you know, you know, could play either role. Um, and so it, it's not so much women as, as the feminine quality of, of either soul. And I'm just wondering how we would define that, and, and how do we know when we come close to society having really embraced that feminine principle? Are there particular qualities that we would associate and attribute with that more feminine way of, of doing things? Any of you got, got a, uh, a take on that? I think the, the females tend to be more tolerant yeah. and try to be more understanding of others as well. Yeah. So I, I think we take that little bit extra to actually find out about that person and, and investigate you know, who are they, what, what are their qualities, um, rather than just taking it at face value. And I, I guess as mothers, there is the, the, the practice of thinking about the needs of others. If you have children, if you're responsible for a family, you have to think about the greater good of the whole rather than just what I individually need. So that is a quality that, that women perhaps find easier. Any others, Jan? It is the qualities that you bring to a family life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and doing all, all of the different roles, you, you know, to be a mother, to be a minister, to be a minister in a place, in, in a university that is seen as a secular university, to minister alongside all other world religions, I think you know, I was really frightened when I first um, was given the position as, as coordinating chaplain because some of our world religions are very male-led and if I can give an example of, of Islam and, and Muslim and I'm thinking how, as a woman, will, will, I, will I be respected in the role that I've been given to do? And, and it is those feminine qualities that, that do that do help in, in the way that um, I suppose I greet everybody who I meet as if I was greeting my own child, you, you know, so with that warmth and with, and with that respect and, and, and in, that, in that, when those qualities come out, the respect and the leadership is, is mutual and starts to, to develop. 
Mm. Sister Indu um, and, and Shoba, you know, both coming from a Hindu background, we have this, this wonderful pantheon of, of the female goddesses, the Shaktis, who between them portray a tremendous variety of different female qualities. Uh, you know, if we think of, you know, uh, Lakshmi, who's seen for her, you know, generosity and you know, sort of spiritual prosperity, contrasted with the goddess Kali, who's seen for her fearsome form, that kind of, you know, not going to be messed with kind of quality. Talk us through some of those, those qualities within the, the sort of the divine feminine, as it were, that, that Hinduism would, would celebrate, particularly through the goddesses. This word that you mentioned... Shakti and this word Shakti I remember once we had a program about the different roles or you would say phases of women so one was the traditional then there was the modern and I think the third one was the I don't know if you remember eternal, eternal. and then the fourth one was Shakti and Shakti basically means power and so Feminine qualities are not just soft qualities like, yes, they are tolerant and understanding, but ultimately power. And so that's what these goddesses represent. That on one side, you need the motherly, the friendly, all of that. But at the same time, the goddess Kali means the fearsome one. And the fearsome, was, fearsome form is that, like you said earlier, we're not pushovers and um, that if somebody comes to attack we can have a fearsome form because um, it's not just an attack that comes from outside often we think that we're going to be attacked from external persons or whatever but our own inner negativity often attacks and so towards our own inner negativity we have to adopt this fearsome form. Even when there's an attack from outside, then yes, we have to have that fearsome form. I know that we have, um, there's a saying, that feel the fear, but do what you have to do anyway. You know, sometimes there is fear for something, but we o we're able to overcome that fear because we know what it is that we have to do. What is our role? What is our... Uh, calling all of these things and so yes all these goddesses they don't exist in real life but they are symbolic of the roles that we can play I, I love the way that they're almost sort of laid out as this kind of pick and mix you know what quality do you need today well here's the goddess who will personify that quality and yes. you can talk to that goddess there's a goddess of contentment Santoshi there's a goddess of coolness called? <laughs> Sheetla. Sheetla. That's the one I always struggle. <laughs> within Islam, um, Mahmouda, the, the qualities of the feminine within that tradition are often misunderstood, aren't they? they are. Particularly by us in the West. And, and women, our perception can be that there isn't a strength there, that there is a weakness. But that's absolutely not the case. It's not the case. And I think there, there, there is a misconception. Uh, women, there is a whole chapter in the Quran about women an entire chapter, so there are 30 chapters in the Quran, one of four chapters devoted to the role of the woman. And women are, there's a lot of, I think what's misconceived is women are protected. There are a lot of things in, um, in Islam which are there for the protection of women, for the love of women. Women are, um, are to be venerated. After God comes your mother. And so if, there's nothing more powerful than that, really. So, and then your father. So if you're telling a child the order in which you, of the, if you, the hierarchy of importance in your life, it's God, then your mother, and then your father. So if that doesn't tell you how important the women are in, in Islam, I don't think anything else will. That's mm -hmm. beautiful. And, and I know within Hinduism there is this word, uh, Mat Pita, uh, the mother, the father. So like the, the feminine, the masculine, the mother, the father. But it's, it's the women that comes first in that, the mat the part, the mother part. And if you think also Lakshmi and Narayan are seen as the example of the balance between perfect male, perfect female, but Lakshmi comes before Narayan, Radhe comes before Krishna, 
So there is possibly an aspect in which this, this feminine quality stabilizes first, and then the masculine quality joins it and partners it. I quite like that idea of, of, of the feminine being, as you say, the mother before the father. But also, I think what, there's a common theme here in that this, the, 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 women are a mixture. Women are a mixture of, of the male and the female, yeah. and we need both qualities. We need the masculine qualities, as you said, in terms of power, in terms of strength. We need those, but we pull them out when we need them. It's not something that we necessarily exude all the time. But one, one quality, I think, that, is, that I'd like to share is that one thing that women do is they leave their ego, they're not ego-driven, they leave their ego at the door. And a question I asked, I was on a panel, um, back in September, and I asked this question of, of a CEO of um, a board, and basically I said, look, what is it, that, what do you like about what women bring to the board table, to the boardroom? And it was that, exactly that, that women leave their ego at the door. They're not ego-driven. They will look at everything in this much. They, they, they look at things with a balance, as opposed to about me. And look at outcomes that will yes. benefit everyone, benefit not just everyone, themselves. Benefit the organisation. <laughs> it won't be about them. Yeah. So yeah. they will look at they look at you know, working together. Again, these things are common themes. Together, working collaboratively, uh, working in partnership. That's I think a lot of women come from things. That, that, that those are very feminine qualities. Mm. Jan, were you going to say something? I, I was just thinking in the same in the way that we've. Um, built up our team of chaplains at the university because when I first started there was only 1.5 chaplain and we've there was now half a chaplain was yeah there? <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know which half we we've got the feminine or the masculine no. but um, we've now got 14 chaplains mm. and we've looked at each individual chaplain not as male female but to look at what gifts they could be bring to the team and to to build the team on the gifts of, of the chaplains. So each of us can do some things really well and some things excellent, but together as a team, we, we can fly, we can do everything. So it, it is about matching um, what we're doing and looking at, at the gifts of, of, of all the people, male and female, and, and how that complements what we've been given to do. Mm. If we look at each of the faith traditions that you're all of you here representing mm. between you, Christianity, <coughs> Islam, Hinduism, there are so many examples of women in all of the mm. scriptures who have had a special connection to the divine. Often it's the women are the ones who, who receive the vision. Within Christianity it's Mary mm. who first sees Jesus mm -hmm. after the resurrection. Um, in, in, in Islam as well, there are stories of, of women who have a very special connection to the divine. With Hinduism as well, there's so many examples. And yet, if we look at the experience of women, it feels as if that feminine spirituality hasn't truly been able to flourish historically. But maybe now that is changing within our traditions. W would, you, would you go along with that? Would you see that there is a feminine principle at work now in your various faith traditions that wasn't there before. Is that happening? I Sister think Indy. within the Brahma Kumaris, it's not so much as a focus on the feminine principle. I mean, um, we don't go around thinking, I'm a woman, so I, you know, I have all these qualities, etc., etc. More we work towards having the aim to have the consciousness that I am an instrument. More than I am feminine or I am female or I am a woman or I, you know, all of these things. What I feel, <coughs> and I've seen many of us do, is have this awareness of being an instrument. And if you saw in the video when Oprah Winfrey was speaking, she said, you know, she just said to God, just use me, use me, use me. And it's like, I think, I don't know if anybody else feels that here, yeah, but that's our inner voice. It's like most of us, I can't speak for everybody, but there is that constant um, hum within me especially that 
we're saying, use me, use my thoughts, use my words, use my actions, use my, whatever it is, use me. So I don't think along this that um, male, female, masculine, feminine, I don't have those kind of thoughts, if you were asking me this question. I don't know about the others. I think the value that women can bring is being recognized. And I think that's being recognized by women and men. And I think we were talking earlier that there are women who will empower other women. But we mustn't forget the men who empower women as well. There are so many men um, who recognize the qualities of women and who will do their utmost to actually ensure that those women are valued and, and used, I mean that in a positive way, their value or well, their qualities are used to, to bring out the better good for society. Hmm. Shoba, anything to add that? Certainly for, for me growing up in my, in my family, um, the women <coughs> always had a lot of say. Um, there was four sisters and two brothers and uh, whilst the, the, the elder brothers were always respected, as, as was my father, but um, all of us girls certainly all had opinions and we were listened to as well. So um, whilst on the surface it may seem that it's a male-dominated area, um, certainly in my family, in my upbringing, the, the women's voice was very loud and clear. Mm -hmm. I heard an interview once with a, a woman who said that in her family it was her husband who made all the important decisions but that it was her who decided which were the important decisions. <laughs> you know, this idea that women are sort of very skillfully maneuvering things in the background uh, to, to bring about a greater good in such a way as no one's ego gets, you know, trodden on. And, and that is a particularly wonderful uh, quality of the feminine to, to be fluid to work collaboratively, to work around obstacles, and to, to reach your goal, but not alienate anyone along the way. That is quite a skill, isn't it? Um, not to exclude anybody. Yeah. I mean, if I could bring in the, the aspect of my work as a street pastor, mm. a lot of the women who are street pastors are actually retired um, women from the church. And we, we do have men as street pastors as well. But we, it's been said to us when we're out there on the streets because we are out there for those who are homeless, but we're out there to make the, help make the community safer for the whole of the community. And we will meet with, them, with people who are a bit worse for wear for having a night out on the town. And often it is the woman that will step into that situation and it diffuses it. Because um, if someone who reminds you of your grandma suddenly holds your hand and takes you away from a situation, no matter what your mood is at that time, you're most unlikely to turn around and, and give any anger or, or any aggravation to, to someone who, who is the, who's, who's standing there looking very much like a grandma. So we find within the church and out there on the streets that um, those qualities are, they really help. And I know when we first went out, the police and Charlwood Borough Council said, no, 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 we don't want church people out on the street in the middle of the night. We'll have four more people to look after. But within as short a time as a month, they were saying, you make, you make the town calmer just by your presence in being there. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Um, I'd like to just draw us um, into some sort of conclusion and we're gonna have a few questions if there are any um, from the audience. Um, but this quote that we started with, the secret of change is to focus our energy not on fighting, but on building newness. And I think we have talked about new ways to be in society. Um, and with the way the world is, fighting is, is often there as, as an option. Do you, Shoba, feel that, that there is room as we move forward for the role of women to step in and intervene before we get to that stage of fighting? Do you see women ever as, as playing that role of the peacemaker, 
so that there is no more fighting in the world? Oh, absolutely. I, that's something I, I think we as, as women can definitely do. If, if we can intervene at an earlier stage um, and hopefully calm any troubled waters, then, then we can certainly make a difference. And I think we all have that power within us to do that. I'm sure there's not a, a woman here today who hasn't at some point had to intervene and disperse a difficult situation that might have escalated into something and brought coolness to it and, and diverted, uh, as we say, something from, from happening. So if that quality can be brought more into society, that would be a great, a great blessing for the world. It's, it would indeed, yes. Yeah. Any other visions of newness from any of you within your spheres of work that you would like to, to share as, as a vision for how the world could move into this way of, of incorporating and celebrating the feminine alongside the masculine? Any other visions for how that might look that we can share this afternoon? Well, there's a positive thought. I, I think with, within the chaplaincy, the more, uh, I mean, a lot of the time religion is blamed for the troubles of the world. Yeah. And the more that we're seen to stand together, to stand together as people of faith, to stand alongside people of peace, then changes will happen. And, and it is in that seeing us together and the relationships that are being, being formed together. Yeah. I think that's a, a really key word. It's not mm -hmm. either or, it's both and. Yeah. And it's both yeah. together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, once we'd done um, a training for conflict resolution and we had to find the root of conflict and uh, what was the seed of the conflict, whether it was on a local, uh, household level or local level or you know, global level, whatever it was. And so one thing that if we study it, we'll see how it works is that when there's conflict, conflict is always between two or more, you can, or maybe you know, your inner self and whatever. But <clears throat> the root of conflict is this attitude or just this thought I am right and everybody male or female we're walking around with this attitude or this thought in our head I am right husband will say I am right wife will say I am right and it's because of this one thought that conflict is not resolved and so when I say or when we say okay you're right then the conflict is, it disappears. And so it's not a question of, like you said, we're not here to fight. I'm not <coughs> gonna fight for my rights or fight for equal pay or fight for, because fighting takes up more energy. And our energy is very, very valuable. Especially these days, because you'll see that <coughs> on one side, we become more intolerant, male or female. Uh, we're more intolerant of issues, situations, or whatever. So more intolerant. And the other thing that's happened is our immune systems have become lower. Not, we're not able to um, fight even illnesses. And so our energy, our thoughts, everything has become more and more valuable. And so ask yourself, is it necessary to fight? Is it necessary to, you know, prove that I am right? Does it make any difference? Because I remember one scene which really, really helps me a lot is that I was traveling with Daddy Janki in the car and I said to her, can I ask you a question, please? And she says, of course. And I said, but I just want one word answer. Either you say yes or you say no. Because she was known for her long answers. <laughs> and so I said, just say yes or no. So I said to her, are we entitled to an opinion? Because in the world we say, 
well, at least I'm entitled to an opinion. And I said to her that, am I, are we entitled to an opinion? I said, just say yes or no. Don't, according to spirituality, <laughs> don't say anything else, right? And so she was quiet for a minute and I'm like, has she understood the question? Because her answer, she's always ready. She always has an answer ready. And so I repeated the question. And her answer has helped me so much to this day. She said, it's not necessary. Because we think our opinion is so important. And the other person thinks our opinion is worth two pence. Because there's a saying, no? your own two pence worth mm -hmm. of opinion. And so even your opinion, when we're giving our opinion, see, is it being valued? Is it going to be taken into consideration? Or is it like, you know, you have an illness, you go to, for, to a doctor for a second opinion, you go for a third opinion. And so <clears throat> even my opinion is energy. So do I need to fight? Do I need to say I'm entitled to this? And so when I look at the root of conflict, it's this one thought, I am right. If I can let go of that, because that in itself is ego, whether male or female. I mean, to me, I dif don't differentiate. But if I can let go of that seed, that root, then there'll be a lot of happiness. So let go of the attachment to needing to be right. The need to be right, the need for your opinion yeah. to be heard, the need for your opinion to be put into practice. It's like, well, they didn't listen to my opinion. You know, I, I gave my opinion, all of these things. We feel hurt if our opinion is not used. So why give it in the first place? You know, your opinion is not something you just throw here, there and everywhere. Every thought is valuable. I was told once a story about two little boys who were arguing between themselves. And the one boy was saying, you know, my mum is the best mum in the world. Yes. And the other was like, no, 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 my mum is the best mum in the world. And they were getting really heated. And eventually an old man came along and uh, got involved. And uh, he said to both the boys, your mum is the best mum in the world for you. And your mum is the best mum in the world for you. And they both thought about it. And they were happy with that. Mm. And sometimes that's all we need to know, is that it doesn't have to be right for someone else. Mm. If it's right for me, mm. we don't have to impose that rightness <coughs> on, on mm. another. Mm. Yeah, a lovely point. Thank you very much indeed, our panelists. Shall we give them a round of applause? Uh, so Mahmouda was there putting forward the idea that um, meditation uh, on a daily basis is something that we can hold as a vision for changing the world. And we will be very shortly experiencing some meditation together. But before we do, is there anyone that has a question that they would like to direct to any of our panelists here this afternoon? Um, do we have a microphone or would you like to just come to the front and I can repeat your question? Anybody that would like to ask something or, or share a point that has struck you whilst we've been listening to what has been said? Yes. Thank you. At the front here, thank you. Good afternoon. Ah, Good afternoon. Perfect. I think you all women sitting on the platform are coming from a very entirely different world. One is from the religious side. One is from spiritual side, another one is from the law side, and from the armed, armed forces mm -hmm. side. At their workplaces, they do have different experience, different meeting different men or women. But at the end of the day, what my question is, <coughs> that time to time, in each field of yours, you might have felt that because of I am a woman, I have not given that opportunity to achieve. That 
is the case in any one of you? Do you feel it has ever held you back doing something because you are a woman? Um, certainly in my experience it hasn't been the case but then I've always gone in with a positive attitude and I've always thought yes I can do this <coughs> and that really is, is you know my, my mantra and I will say I can do this <coughs> and uh, thankfully it has worked so far. So there's no there's no other person I And sometimes it can work the other way that you get a chance to do something because you are a woman and you're given that chance uh, to make a difference. It can work positively as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. We've got another question here just at the back. Yep. All of you women are doing and uh, if I was the boss of Leicester I would leave all the empowerment of running this city to the women <laughs> in the last uh, 100 years women have been empowered and have gone leaps and bounds mm. like they have not done in 10,000 years mm. so we have to give recognition and more empowerment the, all the women in our community, we live in a very diverse city, Leicestershire, with many, many nationalities here. You can't even guess how many languages are spoken here today in Leicester. And uh, we all have to work even harder and work together and support each other. So the lady mentioned about opinion. So I very much like that. And I always like to give opinions which are not going to be argued over. So this is one opinion I'd like to put forward to everybody here, is that all women who are in the path of doing good, we should all support them and encourage them and stand by them, regardless <coughs> of which community they're from. We should all work together as a team and build for a better tomorrow. So thank you very much. You've certainly enlightened me today, and I'm very happy that I was here today. Thank you to the person who invited me. Thank you to, for, for, to you for coming. And, you know, I, I think it's true that, that when, when you lift up one part of society, everyone benefits. It's not just that part that is being lifted up. Uh, everyone benefits from that. And, you know, the masculine can embrace the feminine that men have too. It's not just there in women, of course. Uh, it's finding that balance between each of us um, is, is what's being talked about. So any, any final bur burning questions? Yes. In our, in our orange here, thank you. Hi, Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Um, wow, what an inspiration. It's great to see successful women like yourselves. Um, um, yeah, it, it's just very inspirational. Um, and may God give strength to women. That's all I have to say. I'm glad to be a woman. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Has anyone had a positive thought during the course of the afternoon of something that they want to do or a way in which they want to see themselves differently, a vision of, of, of uh, newness that you would like to share? Yeah, finally we'll have one, one from the back here, thank you. I would just like to say that um, thank you all anyway for your input and to have courage and to see it in positivity and go through and achieve what you want to achieve. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. We, we certainly heard the message that we feel the fear sometimes, but to do it anyway, uh, to don't stop just because you feel you can't do something. Um, and that is true for each of us. Thank you very much indeed for your questions. And thank you to our panellists. Uh, Deacon Jan Sutton, Deputy Lieutenant Mahmouda Duke, Sister Indu and Shoba Earl, thank you all very much for your wisdom this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you to you for coming and all the way from well, thank Gloucestershire. Thank you for having me. It's been really wonderful. Philip has come from Gloucestershire. Really wonderful. So we're going to move into that part of the afternoon now where we move uh, from speaking to experiencing, from, from thinking to being. Uh, and I'd like to invite Sister Indu to lead us in a meditation. Um, so if you're new to meditation, don't worry. Sister Indu will guide you uh, just to be comfortable in your chairs. And um, we'll just play some relaxing music. And this is just your chance to take some time just for yourself to be with all of these thoughts that we have shared this afternoon and just feel yourself becoming the embodiment of all of those qualities. So thank you, Sister Indu. What I'd like is that um, now, if we can go beyond, beyond the physical, beyond male, female, beyond everything, we're going to go to a place which is also beyond labels, beyond layers, beyond anything and everything. And so, for that, obviously, you're relaxed. And I'll share a few words, and we're going to make this journey together. <clears throat> Om Shanti. I am peace. I am light. I am a being of light. We are all equal in this aspect. We are all points of energy. We are all consciousness. I am peace. I am light. I am pure consciousness. I am aware of my eternal self. I, the spirit, I, the qualities within me, I am full of qualities. There is nothing else. The qualities of peace, love, happiness, wisdom. We all have the wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad. I have the quality of wisdom. I have the quality of power. I am pure. I see only goodness within myself. It is goodness which I am going to think about, which I am going to reflect on. There is absolutely nothing but goodness. And seeing this goodness within myself, I travel I travel to a place beyond the physical world, a place which is where I have come from. I enter
enter a dimension of light, a dimension of peace, this world of love and light, this world is beckoning me, calling me, this world is healing any hurt. In this world of light, I, the soul, the third eye, can hear and see the divine calling me, welcoming me. The divine has been waiting for me, waiting for me to come, to take power. <clears throat> I, in the company, in the presence of my eternal parent, my mother, my father, my one and only. It is from this place that I get what I, the soul, need. The soul needs peace, love, purity. It needs these things so badly. It's my duty to connect with the Divine, with the Supreme. He is not going to come to me. I have to go to the Supreme and absorb, soak up that power. Om Shanti. Thank you, Sister Indu, that was beautiful. And if that has left you feeling that you would like to dive even deeper into that experience of silence, there are many opportunities for you to come here and do exactly that. Uh, I invite you to just check the leaflets in the reception area as you're leaving for future events and programs here at Harmony House. You're always welcome. And on behalf of the Lester family here, I'd like to thank all of you for being part of our celebration of International Women's Day. And maybe as you go, you might just want to think uh, about a woman that has been important in your life, has given you inspiration or guidance or help or support when you've needed it. And just in your mind, send them an offer of thanks for the part that they have played in your life. And so go gently as you leave and for your journeys home. And we look forward to seeing you back here again very soon. Good afternoon and Om Shanti. And I think there are refreshments for you downstairs as well if you'd like to have a cup of tea before you leave. Uh, do please have a cup of tea, more than welcome. Thank you.